All right, now in Luke chapter 14, um, so there are all kinds of great truths in this chapter. I'm going to be focusing in on the parable that's given here, starting in, well, it's really starting in verse number 16, where um, it says there was a certain man, he made a great supper, and he bad many, so he invited a lot of people, right? This, this parable is a man, he's going to put on a great feast. He's going to put on a big dinner, and he invites a lot of people to this dinner. And then it says when, when it's time, right, is everything's prepared, everything's ready to go, he sends out his servant saying, okay, you know, everyone that I invited, you know, tell them to come. It's, it's time for them to come. And when the servant comes and, and he meets up with those people, they all start making up excuses why they can't go. They say, oh, well, in verse 18 it says, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must need see to it. I pray that you have me excuse. Like, I just bought some land. I got to go check on it. You know, I, I can't come. Yeah. The next one says, verse 19, says, another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I, I got to prove them. So he's like, I just bought these oxen. I need to make sure they're good. I need to prove them, make sure that they're strong and they're everything that I, that I bought. I pray that you have me excused. And then verse 20 says, and another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So I just married my wife. We got to spend some time together. I can't come to the dinner. All of these people are just making up excuses. Now, what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is the, the title of my sermon is Stop Making Excuses. Okay, all these people made excuses. Now, there, I believe there's a few different applications of this parable. As with many parables, you know, you have, you have a lot of times you could, you could find different truths buried within the parable. There's a primary application. I believe the primary application with this parable is when he's, he's basically referring to the children of Israel. They were God's chosen people. God called them out. He separated them. He wanted them to be a people for his name. And that's where he used the prophets came out of Israel. And, and he revealed his word unto them. And they were to be a beacon. They were to be a lighthouse to the world. But what happened is they ended up rejecting the Lord. They ended up rejecting Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that he is, you know, he's taken away from them. And he's going to give it unto another nation bearing the fruits thereof. And I believe that this parable... Is, is primarily dealing with that subject. Because it says, he bad many, he called many. He called these people to his, to his great feast. And then it says, they just came up with excuses. So he says in verse number, um, verse 24, at the end of this parable, he says, for I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So all those people, I invited them first. Right? I, they, they got the invite. But... None of those people that at the beginning, they were the ones that were chosen, they were the ones that were called, they're not going to be at my supper. But he, he turned around and he opened it up and he said, hey, you know, get the poor, the maimed, the blind, just, just you know, fill my house. And then it was, there's still room. And he says, just compel them, go out to the highways and hedges and just compel them to come in and that my house may be filled. Now, there's, there's so much, there's so much to preach on this, I'm not going to get into all of it. But I believe this is showing, look, God wants everyone to be saved because besides the application referring just to his, you know, his chosen people in Israel and kind of taking that away from them and opening the door to the Gentiles and everyone else, we also have this application just of salvation, of just basic salvation and people getting saved and how God wants us to go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled, he said. You know, you think of if, if the, in this parable, this man that was holding the supper you know, is a symbol, is symbolic of God, right? God the Father that's going to be holding a supper, and he wants his house to be filled. And this, I've heard this, this verse preached a lot in churches, because what, it, what it's referring to, I believe it's an, it's an accurate application of this verse, of compelling people to come, you know, go out, get people saved, and then compel them to come into church. You know, get, God wants his house to be filled. He wants people to come to church. He wants people to, to grow and to learn more about him. He wants them to... to First and foremost, get saved and be a partaker of that supper, you know, and, um, but he also wants his house to be filled. And I believe that one of our responsibilities is to go out because look, he sent his servant out to go and do this. Well, if you're saved this morning, you're a servant of Christ or you should be. I mean, he's, he has, he wants to use you as his servant to go out and do his work for him. God's not the one that's going out today and, and, and meeting with people in the highways and hedges and telling them to come into church. He's using his servants to go and do that. People who are already saved, it's your job. Look, 
God's got in his position of authority. He's not the one that's going to be going out and doing those things. He's committed unto us the ministry of the reconciliation. It's, it's all throughout the Bible. That's our job to go out and do these things. We're his servants, and we need to go out and compel him to come in. Now, what we don't want to do, again, this is a parable, right? We need to apply it properly. We don't want a bunch of unsaved people just coming into this church. Church is not designed... For, for a bunch of unsaved people just to come in and hear about God. See, getting people saved, bringing the gospel of salvation, is always referred to as going out. Okay, Today we've got a backwards mentality in, the, in many churches. They have the mentality of thinking, well, let's just bring everybody in and then get them saved when they come into church. When the Bible says, go out and preach the gospel. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. You go out into the highways. You go out and you find them where they're at. You preach the gospel to them. You get them saved. And then they come into church. The church is supposed to be a congregation of believers. Right? There's no way you can have a unity of faith. There's no way you can have a bunch of like-minded believers in one place if you've got a bunch of unsaved people here. I mean, unsaved people are not believers by definition. That's what makes them unsaved is that they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first, that's the most elemental, fundamental, basic that you have to have in order to even be part of the congregation is you've got to be a believer. Amen. And that's what we want in our church. We don't want to be bringing in all of this, the heathen, the unsaved, to just become a part of the church because that's not what it's for. Okay, we're supposed to go out and get them saved, but then getting them saved isn't enough. You don't want to just leave them out there. I mean, you want to try to disciple them. You want to try to teach them. You want to try at that point then to bring them in that God's house may be filled. And again, I'm not going to get into all the other application of the sermon because it's a little bit outside of the scope of the sermon. But um, what, I, what I want to draw attention to here is uh, like that reference to church going out in the highways and ledges, compelling them to come in, and these people that were bringing, bringing, making excuses of why they didn't want to go into the master's house, they didn't want to go into, into the Lord's house, they made up all these excuses, and I believe that's what a lot of people are doing today with church. Now, it's important to understand that we're commanded to be in church. It's a sin not, I believe it's a sin not to go to church. It's a sin not to, to forsake the assembly. In Hebrews 10, verse 24, it says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You know, when you come to church, people are provoking you. They're, they're provoking you to love and good works. Not a, not a negative connotation of provoke. You're not provoking them to anger, right? You're provoking people in the sense that, hey, you're talking about the things of God. Hey, you're talking about the things about, you know, doing good things and good, doing good works for God. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. We don't need to be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Church is the assembling of ourselves together. That's what church is. The literal definition for church is a congregation. It's not a building. It's like we're meeting in a house. The house isn't the church. Other people that meet in a, in a church with a steeple and a cross and all this stuff, hey, that building's not a church either. A church is an assembly. It's a congregation of people meeting in one place. You can be meeting outside, and that's still a church. And we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We're not to forsake church. Forsake means you just don't go. Forsake just means I'm just not going to do that. He says we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. There's some people, that's their manner. Now look, they might be saved. They might be going to heaven when they die because it just comes through faith. They receive the gift of eternal life. But if they're forsaking the assembling of themselves together, they're in sin. The Bible says, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He's saying church is so much more important now than it ever has been. As the day approaches, as the day of Christ approaches, the, the day of the Lord approaches when, when we're going to go through the tribulation time, when things are going to get harder and harder and harder, when the Antichrist comes into power. Hey, you need church that much more in those days than you ever have in the past. Get yourself into church. And see, here's the thing. A lot of people just come up with excuses. There's all kinds of excuses why people don't go to church. And do you think any of these excuses sounded very valid when they were, when they were giving them, you know, oh, well, I bought these oxen and I got to make sure they're good. Like, you couldn't do that after the feast? You, you couldn't do that before, you know, like, well, I, I can't come. Or, or um, what, what was one of these other ones? Oh, yeah, I bought, I bought a piece of land, right? You got a piece of land. Okay, the land's been sitting there for quite a long time. I think it's going to be sitting there for a little bit longer. You know, have me excused. Or I just married a wife. Bring your wife. <laughs> come together. It's something to do together. You don't have to spend time. Oh, look. 
people will come up with all kinds of excuses. In your head, it sounds good. And see, the reason why people come up with excuses is because they want to justify themselves. That's the whole purpose. You know when you're in sin for the most part. Right? By and large, a person knows when you're doing something that's wrong, when you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, typically what you're going to do is you're going to come up with a way to justify that because you've got a conscience and you've, you've got things in your mind that's telling you, hey, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. So if it's something that you want to keep doing, you're going to lie to yourself. You're going to come up with a reason. You're going to come up with an excuse to say, oh, well, I'm doing this because of whatever. Or this isn't wrong because... Um, you know, I've got this other intention and, and that makes it not bad. And people will try to come up and make excuses. And I get into that a little bit later, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself here. But let's deal with some of the excuses that people might use not to come to church. And a lot of people will think that they'll have a valid excuse. Most people do. I mean, otherwise, you wouldn't even say, I mean, I'm sure these people that come up with excuses, they think in their mind that it's a valid excuse. But you got to think of, Especially when it comes to sin or when it comes to even, let's just deal with going to church. What is God going to view as a valid excuse? Now, I do believe, look, forsaking the assembly is different than I am sick and bedridden and I can't get up. I'm physically unable to make it to church. Okay, you're not forsaking the assembly. You need to, to take care of your health and get better. You're not, you're not just giving up on church, right? There's other reasons, though. People will say, oh, well, how about this? The big game is on. Huh. It's, a, it's the Super Bowl, man. I, can't, I mean, I can't miss a Super Bowl. Or, or my team's in this event. I mean, hey, they're playing on a Sunday. I can't control that they're playing on a Sunday, but I need to watch this. You think God's going to look at that and say, oh, oh, I, I'm sorry, yeah, the big game. Go and watch that because that's way more important than coming into the church of God, into the pillar and ground of the truth that Christ shed his blood and died for. Bible says that Christ shed his blood for the church. But that's more important. I understand, yeah, you go ahead and just do that instead. Right? There's lots of excuses that people will give not to come to church. And everyone thinks that it's a good reason. They'll say, well, <laughs> well, I've got a lot of money riding on this game. i got to make sure you're... Okay, now you got two problems. <laughs> All kinds of reasons people come up with. And you know what? Some of them may seem better than others. How about this? Well, I've got to work. I've got a lot of people say, well, I can't come on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night because I'm working all of those days. Now, look, I don't, I want to make clear on this because I don't think it's a sin to not come to every single church service that we hold. I don't think that's a sin. Okay, I don't know at what level God will look at it and say, yeah, you know what, you're really just not, you're really just forsaking assembly. I don't know what, what, what point God puts that at. Okay, but I don't even want to come close to that line, right? I mean, a lot of people, I made the decision, see, what it comes down to is your priorities. What are you going to look at and say, okay, God said not to forsake the assembly. I'm going to make sure that I don't, I don't violate that. And he says, not only that, even if it's not a sin, he says, look, you need it so much the more. I look at verses like that and say, well, if, I, if this is something that God says that I need, and I need it even more now than ever before, I'm going to make it a point to come to all the, all the services that are that that's offered at church. I mean, I even go a little bit further than that. And I'll, I'll oftentimes I try I like to find out when other churches are holding revivals or something else. Well, they'll have like a Monday or a Tuesday or a Thursday or a Friday or a Saturday or whatever. They have other things going on. I like to go to that too. And I'm, I'm not trying to just like lift myself up here, but it's it's this attitude. I'm, I'm just trying to get you in this in this mindset of you know, you ought to love church and you ought to love hearing about the things of God because. You need to come here and hear the Bible preached and get that learning, get that wisdom, get, get the teaching because it's going to help you through your life. It's going, to, it's going to strengthen you, not just the teaching from the Bible, but also being around other believers, other like-minded believers. That's why it said in Hebrews 10, it says, um, you know, let's consider one another to provoke unto love and the good works. You need that edification. You need that provoking the good works from other people that are in the same mindset as you. We spend so much time out in this world, whether it be on the job or just anywhere else in the time. Hey, look, the things of this world, people talk about the TV and the games and all this other stuff and all these other distractions in your life. 
And it's easy to get caught up in that stuff. And when you're not surrounded by other like-minded believers that are trying to say, hey, look, no, let's stay focused here. Let's not get distracted with the things of this world. Let's stay focused on the things that really matter. Let's stay focused on the things of God. When you're around other people like that, that's going to encourage you. That's going to strengthen you. That's going to help you say, oh, yeah, what am I thinking? I need to do what's important. I don't need to be distracted with this stuff. The Bible says to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth, um, doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break forth nor steal. Okay, because when you focus on the things of this earth and the treasures, of this earth, hey, this is all going to perish. It's all going to vanish. It's going to be gone. The business that you build, whatever, whatever great things that you want to do with your life, hey, it's all just going to be wiped out one day unless you're doing things for God. The souls that you go out and you preach Jesus Christ to and they get saved, hey, that lasts forever. That's eternal life. You help someone lead someone to Christ, that's something that changes their life for an eternity. You just change a soul from burning and being tortured in hell to receiving Christ as their Savior. Now they're going to be forever in heaven. Forever. It's an eternal value. Whatever we do on this life, just, just in the world sense, it's all going to be banished. It's, it's vanity. It's going to be washed away and do nothing. We have such a short time in this life. Let's use it. Let's use it wisely to do the maximum that we can for God. Now let's continue on with this parable here in, in Luke 14. We did the, uh, the, the parable of the servant, or of the supper, right? And the people were bidden. They made up all these excuses why they couldn't come. None of them are good excuses. God wants his house to be filled. He wants it to be, and there's still room. I love that part too. They bring all these people, and he said, look, there's still room. There's always room for one more. There's always room for one more soul to get saved. God wants his house to be filled. The Bible says the Lord is not one that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anybody to die and go to hell. That's not his wish. But he's given us free will. He's given us the choice. And he's also committed unto us the, the ministry of the reconciliation where we need to preach the gospel so people can even have that, that choice. They can hear about it and decide, yes, I want to believe in Christ. But let's look now at verse, um, verse 26. Or verse 25, it says, and there, were, uh, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. Now, this, this section of scripture we're reading here is, a, is a, a portion of scripture that people will like to turn to and try to convince you of work salvation. They'll try to tell you that, look, you have to do these things in order to be saved, in order to go to heaven. You have to live the righteous life. You have to do the things, you know, and, and all this stuff. And, and it's a bunch of nonsense. I'll explain why in a second. Because this could be a hard verse to understand if you're, if you're not looking at it right, if you, haven't, if you haven't studied the Bible very much. Because it says, whoa, I mean, i got to hate my father and my mother and his wife. That doesn't sound right. What do you mean i got to hate my you know, children? Let's keep reading. It says, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower? And then we get into the cost. So let's just look at these first, these first two verses here, 26 and 27. If any man go to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Both verses 26 and 27 are talking about being his disciple. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now we need to draw a distinction. There's a big difference between being Christ's disciple and just being saved. Okay? Being a disciple means... You're following, you're doing, you're, you're, you're living a certain life, you're living a certain way. And people will turn to this and they'll try to say, oh, see, look, you have to do all this stuff to be saved. It doesn't say being saved, it says being a disciple. Huge difference in just putting your faith on Christ to be saved and actually doing the works and actually living your life, actually cleaning up all the sin and actually following and doing what Christ would have you to do. But see, people today have this false gospel, this false salvation that says, and I, and I hear it all the time because I talk to people at the doors and, and it's disheartening because people say, oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm following Christ. And the vast majority of times, the vast majority of the times, you look at that person, if you were to see their life, they're not following Christ. It's evident. But they think that they are. I mean, they're minded, they, they've been lied to, they've been deceived, and they think that because... They try to obey the commandments and they try to follow and do good things and that's what's going to get them to heaven and it's false. And it's a, a lot of it comes from a misunderstanding and a twisting of, of scriptures like these that will tell you, hey, look, if you want to be Christ's disciple, basically what he's saying here, you have to hate your father and mother. Look, it's not about you at all. 
Any of the things that are close, not about your family. You know, you shouldn't have your family, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your children above God. If you're going to serve Christ, you need to be able to serve Him completely and be able to forsake everything to do exactly what God has you to do. Now, it doesn't mean that God's going to make you forsake your wife and children or anything like that, but you have to have that heart to say, you know what, God, whatever it is that you want me to do, you have my heart and I'm going to do what you want me to do. That's being his disciple. It says, whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be with my, my disciple. Now, a lot of people like to use that verse as well, bearing your cross. But, um, well, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in another verse. Let's, let's continue reading here because I'm gonna, I got another passage that talks about bearing your cross. If you want to be his disciple, you need to be willing to just follow him and, and um, basically forsake everything that you, that's about you and your interests and your, your own well-being to be able to follow Christ and do what he has for you to do. Verse 28 says, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counted the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able to with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So he, he wraps up these extra, these, these two more examples with being a, a disciple of Christ. And the two examples he uses, say, look, if you want to build a great work, if you want to build this great tower, right? You think about the great structures just physically, like the Sears Tower or whatever, all these real massive structures. Well, they don't just start building. They don't, someone doesn't come up with an idea. Hey, let's just build this great tower. And then they just start building. Like they just, they just start getting, you know, like, oh, this will be good. Let's just start building some wood. You know, like, no, they plan it out. They, they need to, to do the structural, you know, all the, all the physics involved, all the design work. They have to figure, okay, well, how much is all this going to cost? They figure, okay, it's going to cost this much money. This is how we're going to do it. And they have this big plan in advance before they ever even start digging in the ground at all to do the, the very first step that you have to do in a building. They sit down, they count the cost. Because it says, otherwise, if you don't do that and you just start building, you're going to say, people are look at you and be like, you, you didn't finish this work. You're, you're just going to look like a fool. Because you started, you're like, oh yeah, we're going to build this great tower, it's going to be so big and stuff. And it's like 10 feet tall. And they're going to look at that and be like, you know, you're going to be mocked, you're going to be ridiculed. And then he uses the other example of a king saying, hey look, you're not just going to go start wars with people. Unless you've already considered, hey, they've got 20,000 soldiers, we've only got 10. Is there a way we can pull this off and still get the victory over them, even though we're outnumbered or whatever? Or just think like, well, there's no way we can do this. And you're going to send, he said, an ambassage of peace before they even come to you. You're not going to start wasting a bunch of life when you know you're already going to fail. There's no way you can win this battle. You're just going to, you're going to bring conditions of peace. And, you're, and usually you're in a better advantage point anyways if you know you're going to lose. Because if they don't quite, aren't quite as certain, you know, you get a lot more out of it. But anyways, his, his, whole, um, his whole parables here are saying, look, you need to count the cost and be willing to pay the cost if you want to be a disciple. And you got to think about that. If you say, well, he wants you to know in advance so that you don't fail later. If you say, look, I want to follow Christ. I want to do what Christ has for me with my life. I want to obey him. Whatever it is God has for me to do, I want to do that. If that's in your heart, if that's what you want to do, he's warning you to say, look, think about the cost first. Think about what that all is going to entail before you just, 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 Start doing that, you know, start going off that way. Think about it. Now, God wants, I think God wants everyone to be his disciple. That's what he wants, but not everyone does that. But he also doesn't want to see you fail and start to do a work like, um, you know, me be, becoming a pastor. This is something I had to consider seriously and, and, and try to understand as much as possible. Talk to people, hey, what type of devotion is it going to take? How much time is it going to take? How much effort, energy am I going to have to dedicate in order to do this? Because I don't want to fail at it. I don't want to come to a point and be like, well, this is just too much. I'm just going to throw my hands and quit. Shouldn't have got started in the first place. People are going to look at that. They're going to mock you. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to drag Christ's name down. And I mentioned this, I think, last week. You know, people will look at your life and they'll, and they'll end up, you know, if you're a bad testimony for Christ, 
If people look at you and say, oh yeah, that's a Christian and, and you're just out fornicating, getting drunk and doing all these things, that is that you're bringing Christ's name down and you're dragging it through the mud. And it would be the same thing for me as a pastor if, I just, if, I, if I'm not wise and counting the cost and saying, look, this is what I'm willing to do and I'm going to devote all this time and energy and effort. If I'm not willing to do that, or if it just catches me by surprise, it's, oh, this is too much, I'm going to quit. Well, again, that's, gonna, that's a failure, and it's a failure on my end, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to do damage to the cause of Christ. Now, um, <clears throat> turn, if you would, to Luke 10, just a few chapters earlier, Luke 10. As I mentioned earlier, an excuse is simply just a justification for not doing something. People use excuses all the time not to come to church, not to do what's right, Excuse is a justification. Look at verse 25 of Luke 10. It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And again, this is another script section that people will turn to to try to say that you have to do works in order to be saved. Verse 26 says, He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. Now, that's true. And, and what's interesting about this in another portion of the river, basically what he said, those two commandments, loving the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, strength, and might, and loving your neighbor as yourself, that basically encapsulates, encapsulates the entire law. Like all the law revolves around those two core commandments because Think about it. If you're loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to kill. You're not going to steal. You're not going to you know, bear false witness. You're not going to do all these things. And if you're loving God, you're not going to have idols. You're not going to blaspheme his name. You know, you're not, you, all, these, you know, all the commandments are wrapped up. If you're doing those things perfectly and completely, and basically if you do those two things, you won't be a sinner. You're not a sinner if you could, if you could do that completely. So if you can do and, and obey God's commands completely, yeah, you can get to heaven. But guess what? None of us can do it. <laughs> None of us can. And look at what, see, this guy wants to justify himself. Look at verse number 29. Because Jesus said thou was answered right. Right? And that's true. If you, if you obey the law completely and perfectly, and you've never sinned, then yeah, you can get that. The problem is none of us have done that. No one can do that. Jesus Christ is the only one that's done that. Verse 29 says, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Right? So he's trying to justify himself and say, oh, okay, well, something's going off in his mind saying, like, he knows that he hasn't loved his neighbor as himself unless it's certain people. Right? Because he hasn't treated his neighbor the way he ought to. And then Jesus explains who a neighbor is when he goes through the parable of the Good Samaritan. Right? Where the, the man is you know, robbed and beaten and left for dead in the street, and the priest and the Levite walk past him, and they just go on the other side of the street and just ignore him. But then the Samaritan comes. And he helps them, and he fixes them up, and he puts them in the end, and he's, you know, he pays for all his, his costs and just and really gets them back up on his feet again and, and saves his life. Um, that, he says, is the person who is a neighbor. You know, he goes through and does all this stuff. And, but this guy wants to justify himself. He's saying, oh, well, let me, let me pick at this word a little bit, this neighbor word, and see, you know, um, I want to be justified by my works. I know I've done good to, to my friends, or I know I've done good to a few people. And he wants to justify himself. He just wants to make an excuse. He wants to justify himself and, and just and just um, be be um, made righteous by the law. And none of us can be. And he had, he had the, the improper attitude. Uh, look at one chapter back, chapter number nine, Luke chapter nine and ten, Luke nine verse fifty-seven. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And this is again going back to counting the cost. You want to serve Christ. This man saying, Look, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. That's what is that's what is is and hey, that's great. That's a great attitude. That's a great heart. Say, look, I want to follow you, Christ, wherever you go and whatever you do. And it's great to have that kind of attitude, but Jesus warns him in verse 58, he says, And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He said, look, I'm homeless. I'm going to be walking around, I'm doing, I'm doing work. I don't even have a place to stay. You just better realize that when you say you're going to follow me, I don't have anywhere to stay. It's not going to be comfortable. This is not something where you're going to be, be able to just be relaxed. And, oh, yeah, I'm going to do some work. And then, and then I'm just going to go back to the comfort of my home. You don't have that. And he's warning you. He look, following Christ, it's not going to be comfortable. It's not necessarily going to be easy. 
I mean, depending on, on your definition of easy, right? You're, you're going to have to understand that this is the way it is. Verse 59 says, and he said unto another, follow me. Right? So now Jesus is telling someone else, hey, I want you to follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Now, this is something you can look at and say, well, wow, you know, that sounds like a pretty good excuse. Hey, my dad just died. Let me go, let me go bury him, right? Somebody first to go bury my father. Now, maybe his dad didn't die. Maybe he wanted to wait until his dad died and then bury him. I don't know. But um, let's just say, I mean, even if he did just die, right? If he was saying, he said, look, I told you to follow me. Don't, don't give an excuse, right? Don't just come up with something and say, hey, look, let the dead bury their dead. What I want you to do is go and preach the kingdom of God. You're supposed to be bringing life. Don't worry about people already passed and they're already dead. That's not that big of a deal anymore. It's, it's, it's over for them. You need to go and focus on the people that are alive and preach the gospel that, um, that they might get saved. Go and preach the kingdom of God. And as is in verse 61, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus wants you to obey. He wants you to obey with all of your heart. He wants you just to say, I'm dedicated, I'm sold on this, and I'm going to go. I'm not going to look back and worry about, about these other things. When you're focused on Christ, that should be your main focus. And that's, I believe this kind of goes hand in hand when you talk about, you know, if you hate him that hateth not his father, or his mother, or his brother, or his sisters, his children, or his wife, because... He just wants you to follow. When you think about the disciples, think about the apostles, think about Peter and James and John. They were out working. We know from Scripture that Peter had a wife. We know that. But they were out working in the boat. Jesus came by and he said unto them, he said, follow me. And what they do? They forsake their nets. They forsake their jobs. Hey, they, that was their business. That's what they did. Sit still. They... they they uh, forsook their nets, they forsook their jobs, their livelihood, everything that they depended on, they worked. Peter didn't say, wait, let me go home and tell my wife I'm going to follow you. Okay? And you look at that today and you're like, oh man, that's, that's tough. And maybe that is tough for you to do, but Jesus is telling you, that's what he's saying. Look, no man having put his hand to the plow of looking back and worrying about the things of the world or worrying about other things, he says, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. You need to be able to have that attitude and that mindset saying that I'm just going to, when, when Jesus tells me a command, when he tells me, hey, follow me, I'm going to do it. I'm going to drop everything because nothing else is important as obeying what God has said for me to do. When God tells you to do something, hey, you don't, you don't give excuses. I mean, it's just, you think about your children. You know, if you're a child of God, you're his child and he's your father. I think about my little girl. Sometimes I'll tell them to do something and they'll say, oh, but no, dad, I want to do this for... You what? <laughs> no, you do what I tell you to do. And look, God treats us as children. If we have this type of an attitude, it's, oh, no, God, I don't want to do what you got. I don't want to go to church, God. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to go preach the gospel. I know you told me to do it. I don't really want to do it. I don't feel like it. I've got other things I've got to do. I've got this, this job I've got to work on. I've got, I've got this other thing I have to do. How do you think he's going to deal with you? I'll tell you what, he's going to deal with you as a son if you're saved. But how's a good father going to deal with their child that's just, that just wants to give excuses when they tell him to do something? He's going to come down and, and chastise you and give you a little bit of discipline. And then you wonder, why aren't things working out for me? Why am I going through this trouble? What's, you know, what's going on? Well, a lot of times, I'm not saying every time, a lot of times it might have to do with your heart. Right? And why, aren't you, why aren't you listening to God? And then people will turn and, and, then, and then point the finger at God saying, God, why are you letting this happen to me? And he's up to the devil thinking like, you brought it on yourself. What do you mean, why is this happening to me? You know, you should know better. But, um, you know, so we see here again in Luke 9, all these examples of people saying, well, no, first I want to do this. For, you know, they're giving up excuses. Jesus wants you to follow him wholeheartedly. Matthew 10, you don't have to turn it if you want to. You could turn to, um, oh yeah, go ahead and turn to Matthew 10. We're going to be in Matthew a little bit. Matthew 10, verse 34. See, Jesus wants, wants your whole heart. He wants you in it. He wants you in completely. He doesn't want you making excuses. He doesn't want you worried about the land that you bought and, and all these other businesses and all these other things that are going on in your life that ultimately are, are going to be meaningless. He wants you to follow him. 
Matthew 10, if you're in Matthew 10, look at verse number 34, it says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Don't think that he's come to send peace on earth. He says, I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, here we get a little bit more insight into hating your father, mother, or sister, because that, that might strike as a little odd. But he's talking about loving your father or mother more than me. Right? When you're putting your family, you're putting your friends, you're putting anybody above Christ, you're loving them more than you love God, you, you, you know, you're willing to do more for them than you would for God, that's not right. God should have the number one spot in your life. He should come at the top. Now, I believe your wife and kids come second and third, you know, they come immediately after that, but God is at the top. Jesus Christ is at the top. He needs to be number one in your life. And it says in verse 38, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Now, again, that phrase is used again, the, the, to taking up your cross and following Christ. It's used a lot in churches because, I mean, it preaches well, it sounds good, but I think oftentimes people don't go into enough detail what that means. People will like to use that, that, oh yeah, I'm taking up my cross and following Christ. And are you really? You think about the example. Think about what Christ went through. Jesus was condemned to the death of the cross. The death of the cross, first of all, is not a very pleasant death. I've read some, some articles, and I don't know if they're accurate or true, but when it talks about a person hanging up on the cross with nails going through their hands and their feet, and their body weights just, just being hung there, um, I've read where it, where it talks about how, because you, your, your body starts to sag just from the gravity, and being in that position, it starts to make it hard for your chest to be able to compress normally and to be able to breathe. You start, you know, after a time, you start being able to suffocate. You know, he was thirsty. He just wanted some, some just, just a little bit to drink. And, and, and the amount of pain and suffering and anguish he's going through. And keep in mind that even prior to this, Jesus Christ got beat. He got whipped. He said, I was able to tell all of my bones. That means he got whipped so hard. Tell means account. He was able to see the bones through his flesh. That's how bad he got beat. He got spit on. He got mocked. He had a crown of thorns plumped on his head, and then they beat him with a reed on top of his head. Think about those thorns going to his head. Think about the beating they took. It says his visage was so marred more than any man. You could barely even tell he was a man. He got beat so bad. This is the suffering that Christ went through, and then they made him take his own cross and carry it up to Golgotha and carry it up to Calvary. They made him carry his own cross. Now, he couldn't even do it. They had to compel someone else to come and do it. But he started to take it, and I guarantee you that cross is not light. That was a heavy burden. After you've already been whipped, after you've been beaten, after you've been mocked, after you've been ridiculed, he bare the cross that they were going to hang him with. His own means of death, he had, they just made him do the work. It's like someone that makes you dig the ditch before they kill you and put you in the ditch, right? I mean, this is what Jesus Christ had to do. He still took up his cross. After all of that, he still knew what it was all about. He knew that it was God's will. He knew what he was doing it for. He kept his eyes on the prize. He kept his eyes on what the whole goal was that he was going to accomplish. He was going through the worst persecution, probably worse than any of us will ever go through. He went through, I mean, it's, it's incredibly terrible what he had to suffer and go through. That's what the Bible's referring to as taking up your cross, is, 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 the, is the example of what he went through. A lot of people say they're real flippant saying, oh yeah, I take up my cross daily. Huh. Now, you should do that. Don't get me wrong. Now, and you might not always be in the same situation. I mean, hey, God blessed this country quite a bit. We have a lot of freedom. We don't have the same persecution that a lot of Christians throughout history have had, but it's coming. Okay? And I guarantee you this, though. The Bible says, yeah, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
If you live, God, if you live the life that Christ wants you to live, you will suffer persecution. It may not always come through the law. It may not come through different avenues that you might think it comes from, but you are going to suffer persecution. People will mock you. People will ridicule you. You'll go through a lot, but you have to be willing to take up your cross, whatever that may be. And it's not exactly the same cross that Jesus Christ had, but you need to be willing and keep your eyes focused and dedicated so you don't start following Christ halfway and then bail out because it gets too difficult, because it gets too hard. You need to be willing to take up your, Christ, your cross and to follow Christ. <clears throat> the Bible says, He that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. We need to be willing to do that. It has to start in your heart. You have to start thinking about it and say, Look, I really do want to follow Christ, and this is what it's going to cost to do it. This is what it means. This is what it means to be sold out for Christ. This is what it means to live for Christ. I'm going to take up my cross, and I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what man says. I don't care what anybody says or does to me. I'm just going to do what's right. I'm going to do what the Bible has told me to do and what God has for my life. Now, how difficult can you possibly think that your life is right now in comparison to what Jesus went through? I know a lot of people are going through a lot of different things in their life. People experience physical pain. Maybe you have some ailments. Maybe you have um, you know, some, some domestic problems. Maybe you have problems with, with wives or children or girlfriends or family problems. Whatever kind of things are going on in your life, compare that now to the sufferings that Jesus went through. You've got to put things in perspective a little bit. okay? And think about the excuses that you make. Jesus Christ shed his blood and died on the cross for you, for your soul, and for the church, the Bible says. And you think about the excuses that you come up with and the reasons why you don't go to church. How is that in comparison? Is it really that important? Is it anywhere close to what Jesus went through? <clears throat> the work that God has for you, and I'm going to tell you this, He wants you to understand what it is, but he also said it's not difficult. It's not. We, we make it hard. We have this flesh that might seem like it's hard, but ultimately it's not that difficult if you, if you really think about it. Most oftentimes people will make excuses because they think something is going to be difficult. The reason why a lot of people don't want to do work, I mean, you see this all the time with the job, job people who don't have any character, people that just, that just are lazy, that don't want to do anything. They'll make up excuses why they don't do something because the job is hard. Or because, at least because they think it's hard. Now, you who might have a, a, a much better character, a much better work ethic, you do the work and say, this isn't even that hard. Right? But other people look at that and be like, oh man, that's so hard. And it's just because they're lazy. Right? But when you actually start doing it, it's like, this isn't that big of a deal. It might seem daunting at first. It might seem like it's going to be a lot of hard work, but then you actually start doing it. You're like, oh, that's not so bad. I can handle that. I can do that. And I believe that's kind of how the Christian life is. You know, Jesus Christ said in Matthew you're 10, look at verse number, or chapter 11, Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He said, come to me. Look, you're working hard, you labor. Come to me, he says, and I will give you rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek. And lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus Christ said, hey, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And we saw what he went through. He says, hey, that's easy. My burden is light. And he said, come to me. Look, if you're going through this hard time, if you're working hard, keep focused on Christ. Keep focused on Jesus, because he'll provide rest for you. You'll have the comfort in your heart so that when, you're, when you think you're going through these hard times, you can realize he focused on Christ. Hey, Christ went through way more than me. It should, get, it should put in perspective whatever it is that you're going through, and it should also strengthen you. Now, coming to church, that'll strengthen you too. Being around other like-minded believers, that'll strengthen you too. But keep your mind focused on Christ. Um, I'm going to close with this, this last uh, scripture. If you want to turn there, Mark chapter 8. It's basically just a little bit more of, of the same of uh, what we've been seeing here, these examples of people just making up excuses, not wanting to follow Christ. And uh, Mark chapter 8, Matthew, Mark, it's right after the book of Matthew. Mark chapter 8, look at verse 34. 
The Bible says, And when he called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life, sorry, my, uh, my notes are messed up here. Let me turn there real quick. Copy and paste error. Mark 8, 34. Um, but whosoever, uh, verse 35, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Wherefore, or whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And I want to want to kind of focus on that last verse there, verse 38. People will um, oftentimes make excuses for the Bible. Don't ever be ashamed of what the Bible says. Don't ever try to make up an excuse when the Bible says something like, for example, Leviticus 20, 13, that says, if a man shall lie with men as he lies with a woman, they too shall be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. There's a lot of passages in Scripture that these days in this world will get you ridiculed. They'll say, oh, you believe that? Oh, you believe? And, and a lot of times when people aren't strong in the faith, they'll back down, they'll get ashamed of the Bible. Oh, no, 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 that's not what I mean. And they'll try to compromise and try to backpedal and, and say, oh, well, you know, the Bible's not really saying that. It's, you know, don't do that. Don't be ashamed of God's word. Don't be ashamed of the Bible. Don't let these, these wicked people push you around and try to tell you, oh, that's just terrible. Well, you think God's word's terrible, then that's between you and God. But I believe this book. I believe what's written in this book. I'm not going to back down on what it says. This is God's word. I'm not going to try to change it. I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm not going to be ashamed of it. The Bible says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Hey, this generation is adulterous. This generation is sinful. I don't care what they have to say. You better not be ashamed of me. You better be ashamed of them. They're sinners. They're adulterous. Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed. He said, You want to make God ashamed of you? If you're ashamed of his word, if you're not going to stand by what he said, and you're just going to let this sinful and adulterous generation twist your mind and make you think that something that God said is wrong, or something that God said isn't, you know, isn't right, and then how can you possibly believe that? That is where God's going to be ashamed of you. And I don't know about you, but I don't want God being ashamed of me. I want to be a good son. I want to be a son who he can look down on and be joyous of and say, Wow, well done, now good and faithful servant. I want to see him look down and not be like, Oh man, that's my son. And be ashamed of me. Because I'm, I'm a pansy that doesn't, doesn't have a spine, doesn't have a backbone against this wicked and adulterous generation that will tell you that adultery is just fine, fornication is just fine, sodomy is just fine. Oh yeah, hey, don't worry about that stuff. It's no big deal, man. The times have changed. Nope, they haven't in God's eyes. His word doesn't change. It's the same as it always has been. From the foundation of the world forever, God's word doesn't change. And his morality doesn't change. We need to stand strong on that. Don't make God ashamed of you. <clears throat> Whatever it is, and again, that's a... A little bit of example. I love that verse 38, but even prior to that, you know, um, don't. Um, the whole point is, there is, you know, don't make excuses for your sin. And this world will provide plenty of excuses. I'm gonna close with this. I'll leave. I'll give you an example of, of what I mean. And, and, and I haven't gotten too specific yet with with, with um, sins and making excuses. The Bible's had plenty of examples, but. I think of myself, I used to like to drink, okay? That was a sin that I, that I indulged in. And there were times in my life where you kind of half-heartedly, what you want, you want to stop drinking, you know you want to stop, you don't want to do it anymore, but there's always an exception. And when you start making up excuses, because here's the thing, you, you could always come up with a reason or an excuse to go and do whatever it is that you like to do. So if it's in my example, it was drinking. It would be like, oh, well, I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm going to quit drinking alcohol. And then it's somebody's birthday. 
And then there's a graduation. And then there's some other event. And then there's a wedding, right? And it's free alcohol and all this other. Well, well, okay, I'm gonna do it this once. Oh, okay, well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make an exception. I'm gonna, and you just, you just come up with all these. Oh, well, I'm not gonna do any more. But since it's, since it's this event, then I am gonna do it. It's like, look, you start opening up the door. You know what that does? You just go right back in to that same old habit. You don't want to do that. And, and that's something that, that a lot of people learn over time, unfortunately, the hard way. I learned it the hard way. You need to get to the point, when, especially when it's in the Bible. And the Bible says that we're not supposed to even look at alcohol in the book of Proverbs. Read the book of Proverbs sometime. It tells you about all the sins of, of, of alcohol and what it will do to you. And, um, and a lot of us have learned this, unfortunately, the hard way through, through experience instead of just believing God's word. But um, don't make up excuses, whatever it may be. You know, another common excuse I hear people use to try to justify their sin is they'll say, oh, I didn't even know it was a sin. Now, if you don't know it's a sin, we were going through that last week of sitting through ignorance. It's still a sin. It's still wrong. And when, when it comes to your knowledge that, hey, oh, this is wrong, then stop doing it. But other people, excuses that people use, they say, well, well so-and-so does this. Or so-and-so is a Christian and they do this. So it must not be that bad. It must be okay. No, look, don't go off of what other people do. Don't base what you're going to do off of what other people do. Base what you're going to do off of what God's word says and what his word says is right and wrong because, I mean, everybody's a sinner. You can't be looking at someone and saying, oh, well, that sinner is doing it, so I'm going to do it too. That's, that's, that's a really poor excuse. And then, or even just someone telling you it's okay, right? There's a lot of preachers out there that will tell you that drinking is just fine. They'll say it's not a sin. There's a lot of them out there, I'll tell you that. Now, if you want to be lied to, and you don't care what the Bible says, if you want to try to twist the scripture and just make it say whatever you want it to say, yeah, you can rip different verses out of context and try to and try to make it say something. But that's not being very honest with God's word. It's not being honest with God. God's going to be ashamed of you if you do that. Um, don't come up with these excuses. If there's something that you like as a sin, you got you got to be able to come to the point in your mind and say, what is important to you? Is your sin that important? Is it, or whatever, whatever it is, is it really that important to you? More important than just following God and obeying what He has for you in the Bible, and and being a good a good Christian, a good son of God that's not going to cause and bring shame unto Him or unto you. Um, it, it all boils down to priorities. You know, what are you gonna? What is important to you? Are you are you really committed? Do you know the cost? Hey. If you've, been, if you've been involved in drugs, drinking or something, you have to understand, hey, if I'm going to quit this, a lot of times people go through withdrawals, and then you're going to you're gonna have to go through that stuff. You know that in advance because that's going to strengthen you enough to be like, well, I already knew this was coming, and it's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard, but I can get through this. Many other people have done it in the past. Following Christ. Jesus Christ said his, his, his yoke was easy. His burden was light. But we look through and, and we understand. That's why we have warning after warning, we have admonition saying, look, you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer tribulation. You're going to go through hard times. It's going to happen. You will go through this hard time. The Bible says that God uh, uh, scourges every son whom you receive it. You're going to be disciplined by God. If you're a son of God, hey, it's going to happen, but it's because he loves you. You have to understand that. You're going to go through difficult times, but you can make it through it. And you'll, and you'll come out stronger than you went in if you don't fail, if you don't, if you don't quit, if you don't just, just back out. Stick through it. You will come through a lot stronger. And, and God does it oftentimes to, to strengthen us because there might be some bigger challenge coming ahead of us that we, don't, we can't see coming down the pike. When, when the smaller persecutions arise, hey, don't let that get you out. That'll just help strengthen you for what's going to be coming later. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible and for your words. God, help us not to, to just make up excuses, especially when we know something's right. If we know we should be doing something, if we know that we need to make changes in our life, God, help us to have the strength to do them and, and to always keep in mind what you've done for us. Because when we realize the love that you've extended to us and the suffering and, and just, and, and the, man, what, what, everything that you've done for us and what other people have done before us, to, to provide us and, and to, to help to preserve your word, dear God, and to do all these things um, where they've been strong and they've allowed themselves to be martyred unto you, dear Lord. Um, all of their efforts have helped us today. God, help us not to just trample it underfoot and to just, and just 
bring despite unto your name and just forsake church and, and not do what you want to do. You're going to help us to, to be wise. Help us to, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, dear Lord, but to um, just to follow what you have for us and help us to be strengthened by other believers. And Lord, um, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.